a special interview with Claudia White. Hey, this is Gray with the legendary leading lady, Officer Aaron Soon, Claudia Black. Oh, me, legendary. Awesome. Let's, I think you have to die before you officially become a legend, but I'll take it. Not with the internet. No, oh, okay. Fair enough. We're redefining things on the net as we speak. Absolutely. Okay. So it's been 10 years since your show, and I was at this panel yesterday where I don't think Moses could have parted that crowd to get out of there. What does that feel like? I have to say that... That was, that was really the highlight so far for me of Dragon Con. I'm always interested to know who the people are in the audience, and I'm more interested to hear what they want to know and what they want to get out of the panel experience rather than us just sitting up there and saying whatever we feel like. Mm -hmm. And so I said, can I have a show of hands? I, I just thought it would be overly, I don't know, optimistic to say who's come to the show in the last year or two. So I said, can I have a show of hands to see who's come to Farscape in the last three or four years and it was the majority of the audience and it was a huge room <laughs> and everyone I've got chills now look I don't uh -huh. know if you can see that but just thinking about it all of us sitting there on the panel were just shocked that there were so many new people coming to this program and it's what we'd always hoped oh wow that it would yeah. continue to build an audience all the fans are what I do whenever I meet so many oh by the way, you have to come over, we're watching Farscape. It gets past mouth to mouth. It is fantastically spread like that. That's what everyone's saying, that it is word of mouth. And, and I think that sort of confluence of timing when the internet and the whole concept of bulletin boards and blogging was becoming, you know, coming very much to the fore when Farscape came out. And so we were able to get this incredible online community of people. And then the conventions then add to that because they can actually meet and have a proper sort of face-to-face -face experience. Which is really great for us. And yeah. so I guess when you put out a really good product, product like that that's so quick and so much depth to, then you get fans who can appreciate that and you have a really good following of folks. I'm so proud of the show too and when we were down at Comic Con they showed a montage of, of um, some of the show highlights, some of the great visuals before we went on stage with Rockney and Brian and I was teary and I know I'm getting oh. older and I know I'm a mom now so it, like my heart just bleeds constantly and it's sort of open 24-7. But um, I, the visuals still hold. The CGI was superb. It was, it was cutting edge at the time, and it's, it still looks so amazing. It really does. And whenever I show it off now, they think it's brand new. Oh, so I'm, I'm really, I, honestly, it's such a great feeling as a performer to know that you were part of something really special and to have an opportunity to talk about it and be around people who are just now discovering it. It's fantastic. So you mentioned being a mom. Now you've had your second child. Last time we were with you, you were actually with one of them. Yes. How's that been? How's it treating you, motherhood? Oh, um, it's done interesting things for me as an actor. It's really, I think about it a lot now because my priorities have completely changed. Mm. Um, while I wouldn't have considered myself a hugely selfish person, I think being an artist, you do have to be, to an extent, selfish because the more you focus on your craft, the more honed and specific your work will be. Um, so it's been really challenging to stay working and have to be able to give all my energy and love to my children who will always come first and my husband um, before my career now but it then informs my work in a deeper and and more interesting way. I just don't want to do the same hours that I used oh, to Lord, do. Oh, Lord, yeah. That's the real thing. That's what it's really coming down to. So now. now that you've gone through this pregnancy and, and childbirth, would you think you would have done the scenes with Aaron's pregnancy and childbirth differently? Oh, it's such a good question because I, you know, we saw on the page, you know, it was, a, it was they end up in this fountain and <laughs> she gives birth in water and Brian Henson had had this great visual of the baby coming out underwater and... And the parallel with my life, I mean, it was utterly bizarre that I ended up giving birth in, the, in an odd place, oh. so just as Aaron did. We haven't uh, heard that story, actually. What is that? Well, I, I really wanted a home birth. And everyone mm -hmm. in my community, scientists and doctors, parents, family, were saying, oh, no, 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 too risky. And, and, uh, and my father's an OBGYN, so, oh. you know, he was very much against that idea. That's because a big he finger that. wag right there. Exactly. So I'm going to do what my daddy doesn't want me to do. Um, <laughs> I'm going to give birth in space. Um, no, I, um, I ended up at a friend's wedding out of town a week before my due date. Uh-oh. I smell some thunder stealing. <laughs> and, and uh, well, God, yeah, it's a bit of a diva move, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, you're having a wedding. Well, <laughs> Um, I, um, t if I cut to the end of the story now, I can say that I turned up to the wedding the next day with the baby in a little carrier. Oh, well, that's having cute. Having given birth the night before. I was worried this story was going to end in a bride slipping on the placenta <laughs> on the way down the aisle, and that was... No, I didn't, I did yeah, I didn't, um, 
I didn't make it through the whole weekend. We didn't sort of stay for the, for the dinner after the wedding, but we went back to the hospital. Uh, but it was so funny because straight after I gave birth, um, I ended up in a hospital that specializes in water birth. So I got oh, my that dream, is funny. dream birth because I wanted a water birth at home. And I thought, okay, so it's not at home, but it's been attended by an obstetrician, so it's as safe as it can be. And Happy medium. And I, I learned this meditation technique with birth hypnosis, and I was really quiet through the whole labor, very crude. Birth hypnosis, does that mean that you were not even sedated, no epidural? <laughs> Sorry about that. That's um, and, and that's what I thought because I was sort of si I'm sitting in the bath and I'm you know I'd breathe the whole day and, and we we're living in these condos we're staying in these condos for the wedding and all these friends were popping around and my old roommate popped in while I was in labour and she said hi I just wanted to see how you were going anyway we're going to get ready for the <laughs> wedding soon we're going to have cocktails and I'm like trying to throw a bedpan at her face. Yeah, like this sort of deep breathing. I couldn't talk to him. I'm like, make it stop. Make them go away. <laughs> so I got, I said to my doula who flew up to join me when she knew I was in labor, I said, you know, when do I know when it's time to go to the hospital? And she said, when you're thinking more about going and staying. And I said, I want to get out of here. So in peak hour traffic, we get into our car and have to drive, I don't know how many miles it was, but it was a bit of a way, down the coast. Um, All the while thinking, oh God, don't make me have to pull over and do this here. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I've trained for it, and I've done all the yoga stuff and everything, and I thought, you know, we'll be able to handle it, I'll be okay. Um, and we get to the hospital, and you know, it was this amazing place, and it was sunset, and it was just sort of very cinematic. It was fantastic. And I go in, and there's an amazing big tub, and it was about the size of the, the, the set oh, that they created for Aaron <laughs> and Crichton. And I go in, and they said, all right, it's time for you to have a baby. And they couldn't feel any signs of labor, because as soon as I went into the hospital, it just stopped. And my mum had flown up, and she'd caught a plane to a different airport than the one that was right next door to the hospital. Oh, no. So she had to ask a complete stranger to drive her. She said, could you drive me somewhere so I can get to the hospital because my daughter's having a baby? And he said, hang on a minute. And he rang his wife, and he drove home, picked up a faster car. To oh, my God, to that's phenomenal. In this fast car. I know, hilarious. The plot of your birth is better than Aaron's birth. I, but, I mean, you know, I mean, it's a story that, you know, Aaron and Crichton's birth was written by men, and here I am, this woman going, oh, so that's what it's really like. Oh. So, anyway, we get, you know, I'm sitting at the hospital waiting for my mum. She walks in the door. My labor comes back on. They said, all right, let's have the baby. Three hours later, you know, I went into the tub, never raised my voice, never really made a sound. When they started coming in and talking about getting out the camera and stuff, I'm like, what's going on? It's like someone's having a baby or something. <laughs> oh, no. And, and my little boy came out unexpectedly. I really was. The, oh. I didn't want to push, and they were like, okay, you're ready. And I'm like, okay. And out he came, and I was like, All right, no then. one caught him. There he was. <laughs> picked him up, put him in my arms, and he just quietly blinked and looked up at me and looked at oh. his daddy. And, you know, it was just so quiet and so unexpected the whole way it happened. And I mm. remember thinking, if not exactly at that moment, but shortly thereafter, Erin's a pussy. <laughs> <laughs> she was screaming her Crying head crazy. off. We had pregnant women on set at the time when we were filming it um, who were going, oh, my God, I can't take this. If this is what my labor's going to be like, I just, I can't hear this right now. One of them drops it right there. Okay. They left the set because they were so oh, stupid. No. I said, you do understand I'm an actor and I'm completely making this up. This isn't how birth <laughs> has to be. Oh, wow. Uh, they, they, you should call them up after this. No, no, it's really okay. I'm so sorry. Here's the actual video. Exactly. But I mean, I feel now that I have a responsibility to spread the word to women about what labor and birth can be because everyone normally hears the horror stories. Mm -hmm. And that's what we propagate on film, partly because it's more dramatic. Who right, wants to hear right, about right. birth that sort of... I mean, sure, the details around my labor were interesting, but the, the birth and the labor itself, it was quiet and uneventful, thank you. Oh, nice and up. Oh, hey, it's a kid. Yeah, yeah exactly. Get no. that for you, dear. <laughs> so, the fans are going to love this story. <laughs> you were talking about the fans and the massive crowds recognizing you here at the convention. What was it like the first time you were recognized? Ever. Ever. Well, there's something that you notice about people and their presence. Their whole energy changes when their brain is trying to work something out. Mm -hmm. So once you become aware of that, I mean, I get it myself, so that's how after experiencing it myself, I've, I've become aware of how people, just subtle things, they just, they'll, be, they'll, they'll see something and then they'll go, they do the double take. Right, the, the blink. And, and then they're still for a second, so it's kind of like <laughs> predators out on the prairie. <laughs> Their vision is based on movement. Exactly. And they're still for a minute. And then the elbow, <gasps> if they have a companion. And then it's the look away, 
They haven't noticed. They don't know that I've spotted them. They're not in my sights. I'm just looking at this ceiling. And then it's a slightly more rigorous elbow action. Um, but, but you just, you sort of, you notice it. It really takes over the whole body. There's this incredible stillness. If it's a footballer, whoever it is, someone you knew from high school, something just happens because you can't multitask as well. So you just sort of, everyone sort of slows down when their brain's trying to sort of work through all the connections, get everything firing to work out who it is that they've just seen. And so I can sort of spot that really quickly now. I sort of say to my husband, I'm, I'm getting farscaped. <laughs> like oh, I can kind I of tell. And I, yeah, I'm, getting, I'm getting gated, I'm getting whatever. And it's kind far of scooping like, us out. Right exactly, there, yeah. exactly. I do have a ruder word, but I won't say it now. I bet I say I'm getting frailscaped, basically. <laughs> so do you have any awkward moments of, oh my God, Aaron, tackle in the middle of the street trying to do your groceries? No, and I'm really grateful about that. At the same time, I'm a little disappointed because when I went down to Comic Con, I heard that if you were in Twilight, basically you got mobbed mm. and I thought oh well I suppose that's to sort of you don't want to be mobbed by Twilight fans sorry if you're not, you're not using the no internet. offense no offense no but I mean so I'm, I'm grateful I'm one of those I'm a working actor that's all I actually ever aspired to being I didn't aspire to being a star uh, because I, I don't want everything that comes th the negative aspects of that that come with that package mm. um, so you're about as high up as you can get on the popularity recognizable meter without getting stuck but you heard it she is disappointed so if you want to get no no bar. no quiet you <laughs> have you seen my heels I could spike you and do some serious damage, my friend. Fair enough, I've seen what you can do with a pulse pistol. I'm scared enough of the heels. Exactly. Even with a laser, I'm dangerous. Ooh. She does have the dangerous outfit with the spiky belt, which puts mine to shame, actually. I'm a little bit jealous. Here. I like yours. I like yours. But I kind of wonder why they didn't finish it off. Like, why? Why? I suppose because be there's too buttons. Heavy. I can't hold all that up. Are you kidding? Ah, uh, good point. Actually, it's a little bit sci-fi. It's a little bit Farscape. All the thing there was hexagons and all the little. That's why I bought it. Yeah. Really, was the little containers. Because that's fashion, mathematics, and geometry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love that with the golden ratio. There's a lot of that actually in the show. I noticed a lot of the ratios was like the golden ratio, and you could find mathematical patterns in all the design. Yeah. Farscape was a visually stunning show. So much design. Yeah. Well, what was it like working with that? Because when I go to work, when I get right out of college, I go and there's a desk and a fluorescent light, and if I'm really lucky, <laughs> a colorful pencil sharpener. <laughs> yeah. And you get to go with DRDs and Muppets galore, and how was that experience from your earlier jobs? Is that just overwhelming to be surrounded by that? Well, as you say, I mean, it, it starts with the little choices we make, or maybe it's sort of like the super objective of your life. You think, well, what, where do I see myself and where do I want to be ideally? And I didn't want to be in an office space because I knew for me personally, I, did, I didn't want that. I really didn't want to be in that sort of environment. And so when Ben first took me onto the set, because I'd been brought in for makeup tests and camera tests and I hadn't been onto the set yet, and he said, he came in very powerfully, the lead man of the show, and he said, excuse me, Leslie, I, I need Claudia for a second. And, you know, obviously that's not Ben's accent, but I'm not even going to attempt it. Um, <laughs> and he, he pulled me out of the chair and he said, I want you to come and have a look at this. And it was a really sweet sort of bonding moment because we did not know each other at all. Uh, we'd done a great audition together and that was it. And is this where you were dropping things? Ah, yes. <laughs> yes, you were at the panel yesterday. Well, no, he wasn't in his leather pants yet, so we started dropping things when he was on set in his leathers because it was a good view for us and great <laughs> entertainment for five years. Is this a running joke with everyone on the set? Yes. Oh. Not really. We just made that up yesterday. It made us sound really cool that we could sexually harass our lead actor. I, it did, it did. I was going to say, I'll be sure to do it before I leave. Yes, please do. I keep saying that when a sort of, you know, a man comes up to me, you know, oops, sorry, I almost spiked you with my heel. Um, Threatening me already. Because you can sell your you foot on them. eBay. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, big, hairy, sweaty man comes up to me and asks for an autograph. I say, can you do me a favor? And he says, sure. And I say, when you see Ben, can you tell him that he has to give you a kiss and a hug? <laughs> but the kiss has to be on the lips. You tell him I said so. I'm just saying, he's going to love it. So you and Ben were walking onto the set? We were walking onto the set, and he said, take a look at this. And he was like, I mean, it was the perfect Crichton moment because it was, was fish out of water. I mean, he was, oh, right. you know, a stranger in a strange land, looking up at these incredible sets. No one had really built anything like this before on anything I'd worked on. They decided to change really the way that you look at a space in terms of, you know, sets are often just sort of boxes. They're in domestic spaces and in space they tend to make things more curved. And exactly, as you say, whatever you want. Um, 
and it was, I mean, Ricky Ayers and um, the rest of the art department team, our production designer, um, was Ricky Ayers, and they, they had these amazing ideas for what they would have done if we had a slightly bigger budget. So the lights that were on the, um, the bulkheads inside the tunnels of, of um, Moya, originally they wanted them to be living bugs because, as you know, Moya oh, wow. is a leviathan, was a living ship. So they ideally wanted the light sources to be these glowing bugs that would then would shift as people came near because they would be aware of a humanoid presence and they would, you know, shift around and be our, be our sort of... That would have been cute, and I would have had my room covered with those from eBay. So totally. So, I mean, and obviously that, that was a very expensive effect, so we ended up going, going with sort of lights that could be nailed into the walls. I but think it worked out, because at least you, this way you have the whole, it felt a little more like a ship and a little less like you're crawling through the intestines or something. Right. But, I mean, they, it, it was, when you think about creative minds and the amount of things that have to be, I, I do subscribe to the, to the point of view that ten minds are better than one, mm. but it, creatively, but it is very difficult to, to have everyone feel that their input is not only valid, but that it's somehow ending up on the screen. And when you think about all these amazing minds that were contributing to Farscape, there was so much visual information that, that never made it on screen because someone was having to make decisions every day about you know, refining things and, and what, what could stay and what we could afford. Um, so there was, there was definitely more to come, and that was the saddest thing about season five not happening was just there was this ever-expanding universe of Farscape that, that we, we saw a glimpse of in Peacekeeper Wars. I have a, one last question for you before we wrap up, and that's, um, well, when you saw the, the two moments where you found something happened to Erin, you find out that she dies and die me dichotomy. And it what? Kind of, did, My did character you, how dies? Did you, how did you find that out? Well, did you get like a script and read through it? What? I do what now? <laughs> or did someone, like, is that something you tell someone over drinks? By the way, just so you know. That's a very good question because I was having a bit of a battle with some of the producers on, in first season about how Aaron was to be played. And the battle was actually coming from them because one person would come down to me, one producer, and say, she's a robot, she's got no emotion. And then someone else would come to me and say, oh, God, did they give you that note? Don't play her like that. She's going to be cardboard. Don't do that. And they were doing that to Gigi. Do her with an American accent. Don't do her with an American accent. So she would start with an Australian accent in the morning, and then by the end of the day, she'd be doing an American accent. She's a really solid actor, and that's a really unfair thing to do to someone. On both directions. Yeah, on, and on so many levels, because it makes you look bad on screen as an actor if they're not going to pay for you to ADR the rest of it so that it all is consistent. Mm -hmm. So there was all this stuff going on, and in the end, I was really tired. I'd had a, you know, towards the end of the season, they were giving me some really juicy stuff to do. And oh, then yeah. by, and you know, season two was amazing for Aaron. Really incredible season. And um, this script gets delivered before I have a chance to read it. And it said, I mean, before, I have the, before they have a chance to tell me, and it says Aaron dies. And I felt so satisfied after doing season two because they'd given me so much to do and it was, I just felt so grateful and lucky as an actor, and I was exhausted. I mean, it was 80-hour weeks, 80-hour weeks minimum every week, I think, from memory. So I was tired, and we'd changed locations. We were shooting out at these warehouses um, 45 minutes to an hour away from the original studio, and our contracts would, were not door-to-door, -door, so or word or whatever. So basically, we only had eight hours before we were due back on set at home. Oh, no. So it was really tough. Mm -hmm. And so when I read the thing, I went, I doubt she really dies, but if she does, maybe, like, maybe I could use a little bit of a break. And I wasn't prepared to let go of Aaron at that point, but I just thought, you know what? Logically, I don't think they're killing her off. Why would they give her this amazing season only to just, you know? And, um... I was just picturing you. As soon as I saw that episode, I was picturing you. I would have been, like, screaming, grabbing the coffee. What? After that season, you're killing I think we'd already... I think we'd already established on the show that no one ever really died. People were exhumed, you know, it's kind of like soap dish. So I just thought, you know, it's space, anything can happen, they can clone her. They're probably not going to kill her. I don't think I've done a crappy job this year. I hope I haven't. And then one of the script supervisors came to me and said, um, uh, Claudia, I just, I, 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 just, I, 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 I just wanted to talk to you about something. I just wanted to, 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 to warn you. Um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the final episode, um, um, Aaron doesn't really die. Staying carefully out of melee range, please don't kill me. And I said, oh. And I knew that she was going to report back to the producers who'd been sort of teasing me. And I said, oh, okay. 
I mean, I don't care. I mean, I mean, I, I don't mean it like that, but I mean, okay, cool. I mean, I wasn't worried. And I thought, oh, I hope they send that message back because they always, oh, they psych the actors out. It's like, you know, you do that one more time and your action figure ain't going to look like you, all I'm saying. <laughs> we'll take that burst in a whole Yeah. Side. Have it's you really noticed? Have you noticed that the first action figure looks like the chick that we had that sort of played the princess? Because... No. no. I mean, we were really lucky. Working in Australia was about having fun, but really, you know, working really hard to get that day done. So, it went, you know, your, your crew is your family, and, and that's how it was for us. There's so much about Farscape was family. The whole theme was family, or the crew worked like a family. That's just what I think really showed in the show. It glowed. Oh, well, I'm glad. Well, Farscape's done, and you have your great following here, and Stargate, you've had a good run there. What's next? What's on the horizon? Well, I just, earlier on in the year, I did a, a really amazing animation project that Johnny Depp was in, um, really? directed by Gore Verbinski, and uh, from the Pirates of the Caribbean trilogy. And, um, <laughs> and there's been some great Captain Jacks walking around at Dragon Con. I've really great attention to detail. One in particular yesterday, spot on, even with the swagger. I mean, he was, I don't know if that was put on, I'm sure he'd had a good Friday night. I'm pretty sure people offer him rum every three steps. Exactly. <laughs> oh my God, what a good way to get drinks. Exactly. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. You could even do that in a bar. It didn't have to be Dragon Con. Go in Captain Jack's Fair, I'm going to buy you rum, yeah. Exactly. Um, so the animation, you, what role did you play there? Uh, I played a, a character called Angelique. She's, she's French. Um, so I finally got to... French accent? I do. Would you maybe answer the rest of the question in that accent for us? Oh. Well, of course I can try. Um, well, nice. So it was when I was a kid at school, I learned to speak French and I went to stay in France and... Um, uh, <laughs> I'm joking. Um, and so... Um, Alors finally, you know, I always wanted to do a film speaking in French and I thought maybe one day I would go and study in France and I never got a chance. So I went um, to this audition thinking, you know, maybe finally this is the one. And if I can, I'm going to speak some French and hopefully they will, you know, they'll use it in the film. That's fantastic. I'm having trouble working that accent. <laughs> With the face. The face. <laughs> um, I've been doing a lot of voice work because it's really, really useful when you're pregnant to have, to be able, and oh, what yeah. it does to the vocal cords, you get this wonderful surge of hormones that just richen and, you know, just fill every cell in your body and your hair gets thick and your voice gets wonderfully rich. And <laughs> so I had, you know, I had really developed my voice career while I had my two babies and um, you know the talking books have been great with Random House but this animation for me was really great fun and we filmed it um, actually on a set so we performed it like a play so that they could really get everything they could from the That's actors beautiful. which is the way if they've got the budget this is the way a lot of animation movies are going that they will film actors first uh, and it's what I, I just did this really amazing high production value video game called Uncharted 2. I don't know if you know the original game Uncharted Drake's Fortune. I, yeah, I saw that, that the, the sort of Indiana Jones feel. It does. And um, Amy, Amy Hennig, the um, story director, she wrote the, all the um, cinematic scenes that we performed. And we had this Nolan North, who plays Drake, is an incredible actor and incredible fun. And he and I had, I'm really lucky with my leading man, I have to say, because oh. he and I had an instant brilliant chemistry oh, and so can't, yeah you can't fake chemistry like the reason Shatner and Nimoy when they were here you just see that when two people click it creates great things you and you and Ben Browder right chemistry is what puts it all together that's fantastic so keep a lookout for uh, Uncharted 2 and the animation was called um, well it seems like the real title of the movie is still a secret so the working title is Rango so yeah everyone google Rango back Thank you, loyal fans and new fans of Farscape. That's what I want to say. And remembering aspiring voice actresses, get pregnant, it'll help your career. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. This is great. My pleasure. Thank you.